Alrighty. So I spent 10 minutes looking at the average per capita uh, water usage in California. So these statistics are from 2016. I just went with the peak and just kind of eyeballing this looks around 110 gallons uh, per day. It could be more, could be less. Obviously the numbers are different. If you Google search terms like uh, per family, so I think it depends on the source, it's 260 gallons or more per family. Also depends on where you live. Depends on if you have a tiered watering metering system or something else. So like I said, a combination of factors. I just want with like a simple uh, calculation. I don't know if I'm doing this right because I, like I said, I just spent 10 minutes here. So we have 110 gallons per day per person in the summer, it peaks in the summer. And right now there's a water shortage. So the question is, if you want to get water to the different parts, then how would you do that using the existing state technology? And I can think of cranes, planes, and automobiles. And you have to factor that whatever you do, there will be a, where's my marker? There will be a, um, there will be a carbon footprint. There will be a carbon footprint, right? Unless you have, unless you can actually make the, the, the whatever is moving the water, uh, the, you can make the thing using sustainable energy and then it runs on sustainable energy, whether that's solar, hydrogen, or uh, I don't know, something else. It has to be sustainable. Otherwise, you are just swapping one problem for a much bigger problem down the road. You know, like the climate changes, fossil fuels are the greatest example of that or the worst, depends how you look at it. Uh, and to so come back to the water issue, I just crunched some numbers. I looked at the carrying capacity for blimps, which just popped on my computer. Uh, and I don't know if this is accurate. It says 3,000 pounds for uh, 3,000 pounds, altitude of 4.5 kilometers above sea level. So I was just thinking, what if there was a cluster of autonomous uh, airships? I don't know if this is a good idea, first of all. Uh, you know, these things could be hijacked, they could be weaponized, uh, whole sorts of things could happen. Uh, so I really don't know if this is a good idea, and particularly when you're talking about uh, the number I'm gonna share them. Uh, the, I'll just leave it at that. I really don't know if this is a good idea or not, but to move on, we're looking at, around 40 million inhabitants in the state. It's a big state. So population, which is typical of most human populations more spread out than it's concentrated, unless you're living in a really, really big city like Tokyo or Mumbai or something like that. But what I basically did was in order to, be able to figure out what's the daily usage uh, of water, I just multiplied this number, 110 by this number. So 40 million multiply 110, you get around 4.5 billion gallons, right? I don't know if I'm doing my math right. So we're looking at 4.5 billion gallons of water in California every day. So I wanted to understand pounds, because I want to like go more, more with a weightage. Uh, I don't know, again, if you can do that, but I, when, I, when I did that, this comes to about 30 billion, sorry, 39, 38 billion uh, pounds, if I did my math right, right? Because uh, this is 10 to, raised to the power ninth would be a billion. So if you add the, the 10th would be 10 billion, right? That makes sense, right? Yeah. So 30, 30 billion, right? 30 billion, 39 billion, 38 billion, okay. So then I divided 38 billion by 3,000 and the 3,000 is going back to that blimp because I want to figure out 
the uh, number of blimps we're going to need to get, like I'm trying, I was trying to get a number. And so the number you come up with is 13 million. And I put it right there. 13 million, I don't know if that's visible. 13, 13 million blimps. That's a blimp, by the way. Uh, that's the best I could go. <laughs> 13 million blimps are going to be needed to transfer water if this was the only means, you would need 13 million blimps to transfer water to everyone in California. Every day, every day, 13 million blimps are going to get mobilized. They're going to be filled with water. They're going to fly autonomously because I don't think you're going to hire 13 million uh, pilots. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe even somebody will. But 13 million blimps are going to be required to deliver water. Now, these are going to crash and they're going to malfunction. They're going to get stuck in weather patterns. They're going to fall on houses. Uh, or, you know, uh, the, the cybersecurity aspect has to be considered. So I don't know if this is a good option, to be 100% honest. Uh, then again, we are doing a lot of deliveries through drones. It's happening more so in one some places than others, but drones are like, in terms of weight, weight is not carrying a lot of weight. Generally speaking, Amazon's getting some patents here, which is actually really my idea because it's on my Instagram page, uh, and my Instagram page has a prior timeline that Amazon's patents going in. So, anyways, I'm not gonna talk too much about that, but uh, you know th th those kind of things. Uh, anyways, I, we want to work with Jeff Bezos. So I'm not saying Jeff Bezos is, is like doing those kind of things. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that that was my idea. <laughs> okay. So, um, the, and the proof is on Instagram. So, but the idea is basically you have a blimp and the stuff comes out of the blimp in order to be able to deliver smaller boxes. But right now we're talking about a lot of weight. So anyway, so next I looked into ships and I don't know if this is information is valid, but this is saying that a typical ship can have 25 to 30 tons of goods inside. Um, sorry, a typical container, uh, a shipping container can have 25 to 30 tons of uh, weight and a typical ship, medium sized ship, container ship, uh, around this feet long, I think that's feet, can carry a thousand of those. So you're roughly looking at 25,000 to well, it's about 28,000 tons. I just went with the lower value. I converted tons to pounds. That to me looks like 50 million if I eyeball it. So 500, 500,000, 5 million, 50 million. Yeah. So then what I did was then I went back to what we want to dissect in this 38 billion. 38 billion divided by 50 million is 760 ships. So I put that there, 760 ships. So again, the same thing. Ships are also powered by fossil fuel. So there's gonna be a net carbon footprint, something like this. Uh, how you power the ship matters. If it's, uh, it's probably fossil fuel, unless it's a military craft, which is like nuclear power or something like that like a nuclear submarine. But if you can make a ship run autonomously and make it run on clean technology, then in theory, you can sh sh ship a lot of things back and forth. Now, I don't know how, what the cost of do like uh, what the ecological cost of doing that would be, because that's just for California and if every part of the world starts doing is this number is going to balloon, not no pun intended, uh, to tens of thousands. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know where we're going to be, uh, whether we're going to be breaking ice, 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 icebergs or getting the, uh, the water from the South and North Pole, which again is a problem because the polar ice cap reflect a lot of the sunlight back into space. Uh, and a uh, whole, like not to mention the ecological damage that's going to come from uh, doing something like that to the natural habitat. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, I don't know if this is a good idea again. Uh, I think something like this should be merged with the previous idea, whereby. Uh, anyway, so without, like so, the, so the fossil it's running on fossil fuel, the local damage. Then the the thing also is, excuse me. Uh, uh, oh man, Some, something stuck in my. The thing is, um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, there's a party here. What is that party? Piece of cake. Okay, I gotta edit this video out before I clip it. Let me find it. All right, to continue. Yeah, the scalability is a big problem. The other problem is when the uh, ships are gonna dock, if you do implement this idea, they're gonna, they would have to be, the water would have to then be transported to a uh, pumping station, right? So then you either build a pumping station next to the port, or you have then autonomous trucks running on clean power that take the water from the ships somehow and transfer it to a pumping station, or you deliver it directly to the consumer, or you deliver it directly to the consumer, which is what happened in a lot of parts of the world is what I was sharing the other day. And I don't think that's a model we want to develop because that is going to create a dependency on those things, the delivery system, and water is going to become a precious commodity, more precious than it is right now. And that model is going to have a detrimental effect on the population, and uh, that's not a good model. So we want to make it like as abundant as possible using completely sustainable means so it doesn't have an impact on the environment. And I think there's something to the other idea that I shared the other day, uh, whereby I was saying, I was saying that if you have catch basins made out of, and this is the idea at this point again, if you have catch basins made out of sustainable materials, you can open them up, you can close them relatively fast and if you have millions of these, you have millions of these, right? You have millions of these. And you can somehow have a predictive element to this. Um, so you have millions of these again, right? I don't know how you copy and paste that, so I have to draw it every time again. I'm just gonna draw it with a thicker marker. Just ignore Wolfram Alpha in the background for now. It's a great tool, by the way. And you know, you have millions of these, kind of like a heliogen model. But what you do then is, and I, I showed other sub ideas how you would dissect it up and open it up at least in four. It's gonna open once, and then it's gonna open like it's gonna open like this, and then it's gonna open again. Like, how should I explain that? So it opens up and then you have half a funnel, but then you want that funnel to open up again. So it would open up again from here or something, right? And the reason for doing that is to disinfect it inside. And the canal will open up too. The canal would open up too. So you'd have to build in a modular fashion, something like that. It's just and the sun just does the job, you flip it, it disinfects itself, you build it autonomously. But what I was thinking was you you have weather patterns and you can expect rain to fall in say this is a map of California now, right? I'm gonna try and make a map. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to make a map really well. I don't know, so it looks something like this, right? So, and you have like stuff happening in the ocean, currents, 
whatnot, right? Stuff's moving in uh, to the uh, oceans in the motion. You have cloud cover. So you have then a probability. You have a probability and your probability is 80% probability that there's going to be rain in, I don't know, I was looking at the stats, really scraping for Sacramento. I don't even know where that is, Sacra, is that in California, Sacramento, or is that in uh, Washington State? Anyways, so say there's rain, I don't know where Sacramento is, say there's, the, but, but then we're talking about like a very finite part, right? The thing is, how do you deliver these catch basins to Sacramento fast and cheap? Fast and cheap. Well, I can think of ideas, but the, the same thing. Uh, you don't want to shoot stuff over civilian uh, regions, right? Uh, at least for, like that's the way I think about it. Uh, not for now. Uh, I, I was thinking about, well, we have planes going over civilian areas and the technology is being fairly standardized. But there's a whole network of people that work every day to make that happen have work on it. FAA and ground operators and radar operators and control people, uh, other people in the control towers. Uh, you know, the flight safety element. And probably like strength, like our... Uh, uh, more stringent measures probably went in after 9-11, you know, people with suspicious backgrounds don't give them uh, flight access. So I'm thinking that stuff like that happened. But but still something about shooting. The other thing I was thinking was, what if you had an airplane? Good boy, here I What if you had an airplane? This is a new idea, so you can ignore the wind and the aerostat at this point. But I was thinking, what if you have a combination of technologies? Or maybe you want to get to where the water is falling. And I don't like I don't also again I don't know what the long-term ecological cost for doing something like this would be. Because if you're every time the rain happens, you're sending the catch in there and the, 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 the water is not seeping through the ground and not replenishing the groundwater, then that could be a problem. But it's, I doubt that it's, you're gonna be covering all of California with this kind of thing where it's all just share it. What if you have an airplane, I don't know if it's visible and kind of drawing it smaller compared to what you see on the screen, right? But what if you had an airplane and the harness or whatever, and, Instead of scooping up water or something, it, it drops these things that you see on the screen. So it drops some kind of a container, right? So it drops this box. And it's with a parachute. This is a parachute. That's a really bad on parachute. I don't know if this is visible. Oh, I got to do this. Uh, why am I sharing the screen at this point? Okay, let's. So the airplane drops the parachute. And when the parachute hits the, so this hits the ground, right? Now this thing's on the ground and it can drop like tens of these, tens of these boxes, hundreds of these, right? Or thousands, you have multiple things dropping thousands of these. So what these boxes then do is they have a ton of robots inside of them and the robots go to work. They could be humanoid robots or four legged or like, you know, like maybe like crabs or spiders. And they start setting up these facilities. You have the cash basins. You have the cash basin, right? You have the cash basin. And it doesn't have to look like this, but just for illustrative purposes. And then what they do is, uh, actually first they're gonna dig the canal. So the first, they're gonna either dig it or, or maybe there's gonna be another robot, it's gonna be a digger. So that would look something like a bigger from the boring company. It looks something like this, right? I don't know what it actually looks like. But but this thing goes to work. It digs through the paint and 
or you can make this insert the canal if you can, right? And you, maybe you don't have to do that. Maybe there's some clever way of capturing it. But but basically, once the canal is dug, you set these up, right? Right? And you can scale this tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, depending on how much rain you're getting. It's the it's the predictive angle, right? It's the predictive angle for the rain. So, oh, my my drawing is gone. Hmm. If you sh unshare the screen, it, the drawing is gone. Oh, well. Um, yeah, that's another idea I was thinking. This doesn't have to be an airplane again. This could be, uh, you could deliver two trucks. I don't know, whatever gets there faster, I guess, and safer. Uh, because you would need 760 ships, right? So how many of, like, this is a different model. This model is to do the cash rates. So this model, these two were to deliver the water, deliver the water directly, deliver water, right? Same here, deliver water. And whereas this one I'm hypothesizing delivers the uh, hypothetical uh, construct, hypothetical construct or set of ideas, right? Hypothetical construct. Uh, oh, I'm gonna stop sharing. Right? And now the question is, so, okay, this happens. You have water in some container now, right? Whether underground, whatever, you have water. Uh, you have enough water for 10,000 people, see? Uh, or more, right? Uh, for a couple of days. So how do you, how do you deliver this to human? Well, then you would next next need a fleet of autonomous trucks. And I'm gonna try and draw a truck here, right? If it's autonomous, does it have to look like this? That's a good question. Maybe not, right? Maybe it, it, it's a part. I don't know. It's, but it's not a bad truck. <laughs> hey, that's a truck. No, no, it's an autonomous truck. It's a truck that is autonomous. Okay. And this is got a water thing here. Water goes here. So these are going to come in. They're going to dock here. Imagine it's docked here, right? It's, I just, not, I didn't, don't just ignore this right now. Actually, I can delete that. Okay, very easy. Carbon is the key here. Okay, so now imagine this thing has docked here. So it is basically just going to siphon off the water from here. It's going to go in the trucks, and the trucks then deliver the water to a pumping station. Water, water pumping station water pumping station, okay? All right, then you multiply this by however number you will need. Uh, you, you can make these, I'm thinking cheaply in Cal, well, I don't know, is Tesla still in California? Elon must move to Texas. So I don't I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty sure there are other companies uh, working in the autonomous uh, trucking area, um, not to pick favorites, uh, but, uh, yeah, so that's one. I, that's another idea. Uh, there was another idea I was thinking of. Which is... I think I've already mentioned that. I didn't draw a picture, but instead of a water pumping station, you can deliver them directly to the house. But like I said, it's I don't think that's a good model in the, in the long run. Uh, this is a little, little different topic. I guess this is becoming a little bit unstructured at this point. But instead of trying to get the water to people, instead of focusing so much on delivering the water to consumers or to citizens or whatever you want to call it, I'm not I'm not thinking from from a for, for profit 
perspective because I don't think uh, that's, a, you know, people should profit from the water industry because there's so much water here on earth. Uh, I'm not talking about fresh water, I'm talking about water, but we got to figure out how to make more fresh water from the sources that are available. But we got to think of sustainability because I mentioned we're going to mess things up big time. But instead of getting water to the consumers, maybe we should rethink housing, right? Maybe we should rethink housing. Maybe we should rethink housing. So right now we make these dwellings and they pretty much stay in the fixed spot for the next hundred years or longer, right? Um, unless you have a city that's kind of evolved in the past forever and then you say, well, we'll kind of break 10 of these down and we're gonna put a big high rise here, right? Or if it's a 10 story or like bigger, if it's a city like New York or Kwan or something like that. So that has been the case historically, right? But other, like, so this, this I don't know how this, how, if this idea is gonna have been, it really depends on the severity of the issue you're dealing with. Instead of getting water to the consumers, what if what if you could have kind of like a, what do you call it, uh, the Venus Project, right? So what if this was a cluster of hundred thousand, hundred thousand dwellings, hundred k dwellings, right? And what if you could do all of this? This you can call it dwelling in a box, dwelling in a box. I was thinking about this on my, like on, 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 on like the other day, but I was thinking, what if you could sustainably enable a dwelling for at least 100,000 people, 100% autonomously, 100%, almost 100%, let's call it, you want to have some human oversight so that no animal or like even, like, well, like not even, but animal or human walks into that facility, right? So, as autonomous as it can be, as autonomous as it can be with human oversight. Alrighty. So now we're talking about 100,000 people, moving 100,000 people. Let's you just start with like maybe 1,000, 10,000. So two companies that I can think of, one is called, um, Well, Boxable is one. B O X. I've made content. What my Boxable review was really uh, did really well. Three thousand people have watched it so far. <laughs> that is one of my most watched videos. So thanks to all the people who watched the video. Thank you so much. Uh, that's that's yeah. That's uh, that, I guess it really hit the problem. Like it looks like this is a problem a lot of people have. Affordable housing and Boxable is solving that problem. So good for you guys, man. I am so happy to hear that I was able to bring some attention to this with 3,000 people watching this. <laughs> awesome, right? So, uh, what's the other one called? Possible and I gotta Google this. Uh, start engine. Dome cities geoship geoship already oh, let's share the screen actually this one the other one is geo ship geo ship so what if you combine these two? Some, somehow, you know, not to distract these two amazing companies. Uh, so that is Boxable, if you haven't seen it before. Uh, if you haven't seen Boxable, go through my listing and check out my review, or just go to Boxable's uh, Instagram page. I think, or their website. You'll get a sense of what they're building within 10 seconds. And then spend time on their site, on their YouTube page, on their Instagram, you'll get a appreciation of what this is about. Basically, this is a uh, home in a box. And the box gets delivered 
to where you want the establishment to be made. And uh, when it's done in a couple of hours, you have a casita, they call it, that looks something like something. It, it opens up like this and you have a basic house, you know, it's not a mansion, but it looks something like this, what you see on the screen. That's what they call the casita. So what if you had Boxable and uh, where's the other one? Uh, GeoCities is the other one. It's not called Dome Cities, it's called GeoCities. So let's change that GeoCity, GeoShip, <laughs> GeoCities. That's old school, man. <laughs> I don't know if you, a lot of people in the like, what are you talking about? GeoCities used to be like a web hosting platform back in the 90s. People who build the first website probably built it on GeoCities, first couple of websites, unless you coded it by hand. Because there were no tools, at, at least I don't remember there being tools you have to code it by hand. Uh, so this is what GeoShip looks like. They are thinking a housing element to this. Hmm, that's interesting. I thought it was, it was doing something else. That's really good. Both of them are thinking of the materials angle. Boxable spends a fair bit of time, it seems, to make this happen as well. How big is this? It's a little pricey, $140,000. 14,000 square feet. 1400, sorry. There's a lot from there too. Oh, it's actually $230,000. That's just the base price, $140,000. I wonder if we can bring the price down to automation. Yeah, I'm not gonna edit the video because I don't have time right now. So once they, they conceivably when it's built, they are looking at communities like this. Kind of looks fairly similar to how Yacht Fresco envisioned modules in the Venus project. I'm hoping it's gonna be okay to share these images because I'm just getting these coming from some publicity even though. Yeah, so, okay, so this is a good image. So this is what this starts with. Like that's what a, they're con imagining the studio is going to look like. Then home would look something like this, and villages would look something like this. I'm pretty sure this idea is going to evolve. But what if it wasn't just the geos? What is it called again? Um, Geoship, not geocities. What if it wasn't just a geoship like? Set of truck. What if boxes would come in and say, "Here, let us come and deliver ten, hundred, or you know, a thousand units in this area." So now you have a, um, yeah. So you have like you know, geo chip structure here, and then you have boxable putting like you know. And this is not going to scale, obviously, so you're just kind of focusing on one final area, something like that. And then you would have the glowing some keys, then you have a playground here, right? You have a library here, then a certain pool here. You have like a large open space here where people can, maybe it could be covered, so people can. Um, read here, you know, community activities, and what else? What else do you need? You know, any other things to do? We need to make sure conservancy, um, like big areas here, and then there's a um, community garden here, you can grow stuff here, if you want to hear. There's a whole bunch of them. If people are not fighting for the plot, so it's typical with the case. And, in the city, and then you have another thing like this because why not, right? And yeah, you could, you could, what if you could enable all of this and do it developing a box? 
for a hundred thousand people. Right? Imagine, imagine, like this is possible. If this is possible, then three billion divided by hundred K. Because around three billion people don't have affordable housing right now. You know, doing Calvin, I think, what's it doing here? That's thousand and thousand hundred thousand. Three billion divided by hundred thousand. So we would need thirty thousand dwellings like these, kind of sort of, in order to eliminate homelessness from the planet. Oh, this is not focused here. And I got some my gym bag in the background and everything. You can ignore that. Gyms are open. <laughs> but uh yeah, what was the number? Wow, that's doesn't sound too bad. Thirty thousand. You need thirty thousand dwellings like these to eliminate homelessness from the world. So this would be, you know, inspired by the Venus project, inspired by Yah. Yeah. those Venus project. I don't know if I'm doing the math right, but if you are, if you if you if you have ten hundred thousand people in a dwelling like this. Um, I don't know if you want to keep scaling it, but I think the, city, the design of the city is creating some problems right now. And we're definitely noticing that in coronavirus with the exodus. I don't know if that's going to change after the vaccine, but I kind of wonder what the next one is going to do to the cities. And what if it takes us more than five, six years to recover from a bigger pandemic? I don't know. That's, that's, I think that's a good question. I'm not hoping for, like, I probably think we're going to get another pandemic, but that's another conversation. But what if this wasn't 10,000? 10, like what if this was a dwelling of just 10, 100,000, sorry? It was just 10,000. Then, well, our numbers are going to change. So instead of 30,000 dwellings, we're going to need 300,000. So, so 100K dwellings is equal to 30K uh, global. And 10,000 dwellings would be 300,000. These are the numbers we need to hit in order to eliminate homelessness completely. Uh, dwelling. Number of dwellings. Actually, I should call it communities, right? Dwelling is a place where you live. Number of communities. Communities. Number of communities. All right, so that's another set of thoughts on the topic of affordable housing. Somebody wants to take a screenshot or something? Numbers, okay. I think, I hope I'm doing the math right. Now, go back to the main question. 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 Water, 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 right? Water. What's going to happen? Well, how are you going to get water here in these new dwellings? Well, how do we get water right now? If this is the planet, if this is the planet, and I'm just doing this for comparison sake, this much is rock. Or well, not water, and this much is water, right? Kind, kind of, sort of. Out of this, I, I haven't prepared. I was going to talk about this because I haven't prepared for this, but I would think less than one percent in its natural form is fresh water. Fresh water, right? And all the humans live here, primarily. For the better part, unless you're living in, uh, yeah, like everyone's living here, unless you're on a ship or something where you're like part of the Navy. So you're living on a ship for a couple of months, but that's statistically, that's a very small number of humans, right? As remarkable as that is, it's a small number. I don't think we have floating cities and stuff like that. Uh, we 
I've yeah, already shared my thoughts on seawater and desalination. And I don't think that's a good sustainable practice the way it's being done right now. So the question is, how are we going to get water to these new dwellings? And I've shared some ideas. Um, the other idea, I've, I've thought about this, and I'm going back to water now, but I recorded another segment as a part of a longer video, so it may get missed. So this goes back to this uh, idea of the lagoon. And so now if you have seawater here, seawater, right? The existing, let's say this is the boundary, right? The existing uh, desalination techniques are not sustainable, right? Uh, so the idea was you have like a, some kind of a channel coming in and there are these devices, devices. You don't have to put them right on the channel or maybe you do, but these are hypothetical devices, hypo, hypothetical devices that talk to simpler life forms plus bacteria, right? And this is a hypothetical device. To the best of my knowledge, such no such device exists. I could be wrong, okay? But you, what if you had some device and you, what you do is you put a lot of these here, right? And then you have a catch basin. And then you put a device right in there as well, right? So instead of simpler life form, simpler life form congregating around this thing, they get a signal in a sustainable, in a safe way, not, nothing that impacts their gen genetics or uh, their physiology in general or anything like that and has a negative effect on it. Right. So basically you're trying to get stuff to go back to the ocean or stay there and not come into the channel. So maybe you put some, maybe you put them in the water, right? Maybe you put this hypothetical structure in the water and that's not going to make it a dead zone. That's just, you're just communicating with these creatures, you're not trying to scare them. You're just trying to communicate with them. This is very hypothetical. We have to appreciate this. Uh, but what if it was possible, right? And you're trying to, this is, this, it, it, this is, this one doesn't exist. So I'll put a question mark over how this is gonna be made, right? How these are gonna be made. What if you placed a lot of these uh, hypothetical uh, devices in a, like a shallow body of water somewhere, right? I'm thinking it's gonna be better if you go with the shallow end than, uh, or well, most like depends, right? So it has to be safe though. It has to be safe for humans, for uh, every, every life form, every life form, tiny ones, human form, other animals, fish, very safe, right? And it should not have a negative impact on the bacteria. It should not scare it, stuff like that. I don't know if the bacteria have emotions or they have vision system, it seems. So I don't know, do it. Some people say bacteria are more clever than humans remains to be seen, right? Anyways, so basically you will create a cluster of these channels and then uh, you, will, you will keep, you don't wanna have one channel, I don't think about it in a lot of detail, you don't wanna have one channel go into another, but you are basically trying to get the water uh, the, the life to go back, but you're not trying to get it back to where it came from because then they would be stuck in a loop, right? These are tiny creatures. It may take them days, days to just if, go from like here to here. And this could only be like 100 meters, right? Uh, or it could be a kilometer, but you see my point. So you want to build this in a manner whereby they can go back safely and it's at a distance, at a distance. And maybe you can spread this out. Maybe you can spread it out in the farther reaches and extend the range, so to speak. 
but so these are the structures and then um, there's a company I was, I was talking about in the, the video about desalination it's uh, they're installing something in uh, north west Saudi Arabia, there's a new city, I think they're building this called EOM, if I remember correctly, EOM. And that's where this thing is going, right? Not this thing, but their idea is simply to just take the water from the sea. They're, they're simply just doing this. There's a physical literally looks like this. They're sucking the water in, and then they put a dome on top of this thing. It's not triangular, it's actually circular, or sorry, rectangular, it's actually circular. And then they have a mechanism. It's basically when like you uh, put a sheet of plastic on top of a bowl and you put a penny to make a depression. And as the water evaporates, it rises up, hits the ceiling of that plastic or whatever, and it falls into the um, in, into a cup in the middle of that uh, bowl. So you're collecting fresh water through the process of evaporation. But obviously instead of plastic, they've built it as a glass dome. But then you can do whatever you want. Once there's no, like you've sampled all of this water and there are no, like zero creatures in there, then you can extract water, right? So now how will this hypothetical, how will this hypothetical device be built? As crazy as it may sound. Uh, let's talk about this. So, okay, let, any, like, so sometimes Hollywood doesn't make dystopian movies, right? And if you remember the movie Arrival, this is science, uh, well, it's science fiction, right? But I think the girl who plays the scientist is named, she's played by Amy Adams, right? So if you remember, I think she was a linguist. She, she knew about languages. I think that's what it is, right? So again, I haven't done a lot of research here, as you can tell, but people actually do this. Not in terms of alien languages, but people study languages and how they're formed over the many thousands of years and how, how they're formed, how they're composed, what, what comprises different parts of this, like a language, and like what is speech, and, what are sentences and how are the sentences, like a lot of things go into the enablement of like the language. And this is not a, a skill that we are born with. We acquire this through uh, immersion and uh, yeah, okay. So now if you were gonna make, somebody was gonna make, this could be quite lucrative. If somebody's gonna make this hypothetical device, it could, it help improve a lot of lives. It could, it could alter the future of our species. Because if you create this hypothetical device, if somebody creates this hypothetical device, then you have a capacity to liberate at least 3 billion people. I would think 3 billion, because I would think, I think this number is higher. Because this includes 2 billion people who don't currently have a dwelling. It includes the 1.7 the 1 and 1.8 billion, something like it's around those numbers. Uh, this includes that number who don't have housing and who don't have a bank. So I will just use dollar to denote this is a global tender right now. But then you have no ability to be able to bank. They have no fixed residence uh, or a good shelter. And we're looking at at least 3 billion people. I think this number is higher because a lot of people, even in the Western hemisphere are, are uh, something changed in terms of economics in the past 15, 20 years. And a lot of people started living with their parents. So I'm thinking the price of housing is becoming a little like sustainable, right? But this has a huge potential. So anyways, how would I, how would I conceive, not to sound all that, but how would, I, how would I conceive of this device to be made? It reminds me, like of this cartoon I used to watch, this kid had a, uh, anyways, I'm not gonna talk about that right now, but uh, it's just imagine, like let's imagine, right? So this was the movie and the, in the in like the people who could make, help enable this, imagine this was a team now, right? This actually was a team. 
because it was her and Lawrence Whitaker and the Jeremy guy, I forget his name, he was uh, also in the Avengers movie, I think. Jeremy, that's what, anyways, so they were on the team, right? So if, now they were talking to this octopus kind of creature that came in spaceships. I don't know what that looks like an octopus, but <laughs> right? They came in these space, like this all little kind of structure, and there were octopus in there. There was actually more than one. And they would make some splotchy thing on the thing in the pool, and she would decode it. But we're not talking about octopus, we're talking about bacteria here on Earth. Right? And I've shared some names of who like how how would I put this thing together? I, 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 like in a random order, I'm thinking. Uh, Dr. Stephen Pinker, he knows a fair bit about languages. So he has many students uh, studying under him, right? Graduate level, uh, PhD level, I'm thinking. The other individual I think who should be here is Chandra, Dr. Chandra Vikrama Singhe. Vikrama Singhe, right? Uh, knows a fair bit about astrobiology, uh, astronomy in general, and I think his suggestions could be quite valuable towards helping enable some structure like this. Um, Dr. Reginald Farrell, I put this in the other video. I forget all the names I mentioned in the other video. Reginald Farrell, right? Uh, and anyone with, with a similar kind of background. Then you need, uh, yeah, well, I'm thinking like which department in the military though. Uh, depends on how this thing is evolved, right? How this, how this thing materializes, uh, how much energy is gonna consume, things like that. Um, I was start with that. Like I was just like focusing on the language aspect to develop more models to be able to talk to bacteria and simple life form. Bacteria plus other simpler life forms. Okay. Okay. Bacteria and other simpler life forms. Right? This this is, if somebody wants to take a screenshot, now is a good time. This is how it starts. I can't think of other names. Maybe, maybe Noam Chomsky, because he's done. Uh, how do you say his name? Chom Chomsky. I've never read his books, but I think he started as a linguist, right? He went into politics and stuff like that. But he knows a fair bit about lang like how languages are structured. So then you would need somebody with a background and the ability to be able to send make those things. So I would think you would need maybe sonar plus background in electrical engineering, right? Then you need also people who study communication patterns for other creatures, behaviors, patterns. Maybe somebody in the team of maybe graduate students from, um, What's her name? Jeez, uh, older. <laughs> uh, Martina Chapman. Uh, I forget this name. Uh, Diane Fossey. There's a couple, but um, Jane Goodall. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So students of Jane Goodall. Students from of, of Jane Goodall and other individuals who have uh, helped. Right, and then you need a, a whole team whereby you are studying these molecular creatures um, in a lot of depth. 
So somebody with a background in cellular biology with a core focus on uh, the com communication patterns, communication patterns of creatures at that level, right? So I don't know, this is just like very uneducated top of my head kind of a set of ideas on how something like this could be enabled. But if somebody can crack this code, I really think this would be world changing. This would be world changing for Earth, for uh, potentially Europa, potentially in other habitats. And this would eventually become a key component of uh, expanding through the solar system and eventually through the galaxy, starting with Earth. You need to do this right on Earth so that there's a direct impact on not just the lives of the 3 billion humans, but also to make sure that the seawater remains alive. See the seas continue to thrive and remain alive. Because if we are taking the water from the sea right now, the way we're taking it, then it could be a lot of problems. Okay, so I'm gonna ignore, like erase this right now, not ignore. Um, that's interesting, why is he ignore? A little bit of Douglas Hofstadter is kicking in right now. Slow down, no mental process video will make sense out of it. I guess ignore and erase would sit in the same portion of the brain and there was some kind of variable in the brain. So erase means make space and ignore means not let some stimuli come in so that that space remains empty. I don't know, maybe that's, I don't know. Or maybe subconsciously, I do wanna not focus on this after making this video because I need to prepare for the uh, challenge. That's what I'm really gonna do today, right? Anyway, so just to recap, uh, I spoke about the, the water. Uh, I started with water and my thoughts on uh, some ideas on how that could be provisioned in the short term. Uh, I don't know if those are good ideas. Uh, maybe you need to haul water just using trains. I don't know what the solution is gonna be. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Then I kind of did a segue instead of saying, instead of getting water to the, the, the people, what if you could move people in a quality sense of the word imaginable, right? What if people, when they move, don't have to live in like, uh, I'll use good line, uh, not great dwellings. They didn't have to live in like a shanty refugee camp or something like that. Uh, what if they could, what if we could just move people to really amazing dwellings and do it at a very economical price point? Now it's gonna change some things because some people may are like, oh no, price of real estate and it's gonna, you know, and all these things are attached to it, Rona, Home Depot and stuff like that. Um, so somebody can figure out the economics of the propositions. I'm just saying, what would the cost of not doing something like I proposed? What if you have to move uh, a, a million people, right? Uh, whether it's Katrina or uh, uh, like, you know, I know, or like uh, just the refugee situation we have on the earth right now, uh, whether it's not just a million, was 10 million or 100 million, or maybe it's a billion, maybe a billion, maybe we have to, maybe have to move a billion people in the future. Who knows? I don't, I don't know, right? I don't know how things are going to change. But what if you have to? And what if there, like, what if you could enable a plan? using sustainable means. So anyways, to segue from that, I said that I'm moving the water, uh, which seems like a logistically challenging thing. What if you could enable dwellings, 100K, uh, what was the number? How many dwellings did we say we were gonna need? Yeah, I think it was from 30,000 to 300,000 dwellings, some, something in that range, depends on how you break them up and how you enable them and things like that but that was only for a figure of 3 billion people. Yeah, yeah, 3 billion people. So that looks like an achievable number to me. That looks like a really achievable number. So instead of focusing on just the dwelling, what if we take a module, like a, 
the community kind of angle to this and bring some energy and uh, three million people coming online would totally alter this the trajectory of our uh, species. Um, and I, uh, that's what I, that's, I'm thinking like things like enabling terraforming Venus and Mars, that's gonna come from the collective energy of a lot of humans. And the, my longer term thinking is that that's the well being of all the humans on this planet is gonna, that positive energy is gonna feed into making these visions come true. And that's gonna set a foundation for the next 1000 years. Uh, at least that's the way I look at it. Uh, one last idea I had for water. This is really crazy. I'm kind of going back between dwellings and water. Uh, it's an inherent, it's a, it's a core part of our the civilization. Usually cities and towns are formed around rivers or lakes. Uh, unless you live like somewhere or unless you desalinate it, which seems to be a growing trend. But uh, this takes me back to John Hunter's space gun. And this is definitely the craziest idea that I've thought of uh, in order to be able to, uh, it, it, well, what, what if you have all, like you have a water source, right? I don't know where this is going to be. And it really depends how you source this. But if you could build a series of John Hunter space guns, they kind of look something like this, right? They have concentric circles here. And what if you build a lot of these? And what this does is it, 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 it makes these capsules of water and it coats it in some kind of gelatinous structure. Because uh, you don't want to like coat it in plastic and then create like uh, stuff. So maybe it's, it's made out of some kind of synthetic biology or something. And what you do then is you shoot these blocks of ice, coated blocks of ice with some kind of biological material around them, which is safe for, for human consumption, maybe some kind of jelly or something, I don't know. But then you'd have to separate. But you basically shoot these up in orbit. And what happens in orbit is these things combine together and you make them big block, right? Uh, covering it with the biodegradable material is very important. So now you have a chunk of ice. I don't know how, how big it is. It's half a ton. I don't know what it is. You gotta you gotta launch it back safely. But then you once it's in orbit, the cost to shoot it using John Hunter's space gun would entail this is definitely a crazy idea. Would entail that the price drops substantially. Price will drop exponentially if you uh, do it for at least water. You can do it for other things too. Uh, probably not going to make the water uh, some of the rocket companies too happy when this technology is perfected, because I think this is one of the cheapest ways to get stuff in orbit, short of uh, actually building mass scale uh, uh, mass drivers. Uh, but I don't know what kind of elevation you need to build the mass scale the mass drivers at. Wikipedia says those things are achievable right now. I didn't look uh, like into into it in a lot of depth. But basically, once you have this thing in orbit, what you then do is you wait for the Earth to turn, because Earth is spinning around quite rapidly. So maybe you provision this. Now I'm just saying somewhere in uh, you know like where there's abundant water and uh, uh, there's some need to be able to export that water and source using ethical means. But if you put it in a ship and you do all that, it just takes too much time. Now you have a chunk of, uh, like you have like a small comic, uh, like a ton, not too big, obviously, you know, you don't want it to like unintentionally fall somewhere and cause from. But thing is like re-entry, the, the, the re-entry is the problem because this thing, however much it weighs, uh, however, however much it weighs, as it comes down in the atmosphere, it's gonna burn this thing is going to start burning, right? This is, burn, this is now burning, evaporating. And as it burns, it evaporates, right? Now, if you encase it in metals, if you now encase this thing in metals, now I would say you put it in a metallic box, the whole thing, right? 
same thing, but in metal. So now the water or ice or whatever is in a metal container. Then the metal is going to burn. And then if you do a lot of these, then you have like the runoff from the burned metal in the atmosphere. So if you scale this up and you're doing hundreds of thousands of these every year, then that's a problem. So I don't know. I don't know. Some, somehow if you can get water into orbit and then bring it down safely and sustainably, that could be another idea. Uh, then the ideas are in the domain of, I'm not, I don't know anything about what I'm talking about, but then you would be looking at um, uh, like, like geoengineering, so making weather patterns do what we want them to do, where we want them to do it. Like, so say this is somewhere, this is now California, right? California's got this acute problem right now. I'm going to try to draw California again. Just say this is California, and that's the Pacific. And there's the, the rain was expected to kind of go there to Washington State. Now you modify the climate, you make the clouds come a little bit here, so it starts raining here in this region as well. Well, if you change this here in this local cluster uh, of the West, the American West, then doing so could, in theory at least, this is say like scale, right? This is a scale. Imagine this is Earth now, and we're just talking about, let me say this is, and draw, I'll try to draw North America. So we're just talking about this part. And we said if we did somehow, could modify, somehow we could modify the climate here. It turns out it may modify the climate right here in the middle of the Atlantic or like in UK, right? Or maybe Australia or maybe like, I don't know, like in Mozambique or I don't know, I'm just thinking of random places. Because we don't know how these weather patterns are interconnected. And it could be, I mean, I'm not going to speculate beyond that. But yeah, anything short of that would require some other kind of geoengineering, which I don't know anything about. I've only read one book on this subject that goes back at least 12 years, maybe longer. Um, and these are my set of thoughts. And thanks for watching. Have a nice day.